pretty immediately. Hello. Good afternoon. Um, so, uh, I'm, um, I'm Robert Draper. I write for National Geographic, and you are at the panel Environmental Deficit Disorder, the Biology of Not Being Outdoors. I'm going to introduce our panelists in a minute uh, and then uh, throw out a few uh, discussion topics and ultimately turn the microphones over to you all. But uh, I will begin by asserting the moderator's prerogative and mount a full-on fu uh, filibuster for uh, at least a few minutes in an effort to kind of frame um, this issue. Um, in learning about this panel, you likely read the uh, description uh, in, uh, in uh, what the forum has put out that um, uh, made reference to the British survey in 2002 that British kids can more readily identify uh, Japanese cartoon characters than they can um, native plants and animals such as oak trees and, and otters. Um, that's the British, uh, and that was a study in 2002. A few years later, uh, the University of Michigan produced a study that concluded that American children spent on average 50% uh, less time outdoors than they did 20 years ago. That's the U.S. Uh, last year, an international study surveyed 2,400 mothers in 16 countries, including the U.S., and it found that while 33% uh, of the American mothers who were surveyed said that their kids uh, often explored nature, in India that number was 18%. In Indonesia, it was 7%. In China, it was 5%. So this is a global phenomenon. Uh, how did it come to be? Uh, is the culprit uh, urbanization? Is it globalization? Is it the technological backlash that ironically finds that in this increasingly connected, wireless, paperless, seemingly eco-friendly world that we have spawned unwittingly a generation of agoraphobes who cannot identify, much, much less understand, relate to, uh, and defend the greenness around them. Uh, what I'm going to suggest <clears throat> is that this phenomenon of nature deficit disorder, which I believe was a term coined uh, by the author uh, Richard Louvre around 2002 or so, is more than just a lamentable quirk of modern society. Um, now, Louv and other scientists have chiefly focused on children, uh, and mainly American children. Uh, they found that kids uh, who are not regularly exposed to nature are more prone to obesity, to attention deficit disorder, to myopia, to depression, and to a whole range of cognitive um, and emotional difficulties. Uh, but we shouldn't and won't um, limit this discussion uh, just to children. Uh, or just to Americans. This is indeed, as I say, a global phenomenon. Um, clearly, there are immediate health implications to uh, this um, environmental deficit disorder, but I think that maybe we should um, blow out the issue, as it were, and ask ourselves what else happens when there is a growing disconnect uh, between modern society uh, in its wider biosphere. Uh, can, for example, we draw a line from a diminishing understanding of the world around us uh, to uh, the sobering conclusion uh, by many scientists that we are losing biodiversity uh, at an unprecedented rate? I, th I think we can draw that length. I think we should draw that length. Um, finally, uh, here's something else that we probably should consider. Um, here in America, Demographic trends indicate uh, that within a few decades, by say 2050 or so, the majority of its citizens uh, will be comprised of the same minority groups in which the disconnect from nature is most profound. Uh, to ignore that fact, as discomforting as it may be for some, is to surrender a ground war in uh, uh, the environmental movement that I think is thoroughly winnable. Uh, so, those are among the things I think uh, we can talk about when we talk about environmental de uh, deficit disorder, and here the folks will be talking about it with us to my immediate right is um, Sally Bingham, uh, who is simultaneously an Episcopal priest and environmental activist. Um, she's the founder and president of the uh, Regeneration Project, which is connected with 
over a thousand congregations, I think, around the country uh, to 10,000. 10, good God, <laughs> lost a zero um, uh, to bring uh, to bring recognition of environmental issues to the to the faith community. Um, to her right is uh, Audrey Peterman, who, uh, with her uh, husband Frank, is the co-founder of Earthwise Productions. Uh, which promotes environmental awareness, uh, particularly among underrepresented segments of uh, uh, our diverse country. And together they've written um, this uh, book, uh, Legacy on the Land, A Black Couple Discovers Our National Inheritance and Tells Why Every American Should Care. And to her right is her husband, Frank Peterman, who is the public and political um, uh, outreach director for the Wilderness Society's um, Southeast region and uh, through the society has co-founded um, Keeping It Wild, uh, which brings together members of di diverse communities to promote stewardship of the natural lands in the southeast. So I thought I would um, begin with the, the rather obvious question of, of, uh, of the way we live today um, and uh, whether uh, owing to uh, our increasing urbanization, um, it's, uh, it's right and fair and, and uh, uh, and verifiable um, that, uh, that 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 is a factor linking us to uh, a lot of the alarming health trends. Uh, Audrey, you, you were, were born and raised in Jamaica, and I dare say that the, the life that uh, you lived growing up in is quite different from uh, uh, the way Americans and many others in the world find themselves today, and I wonder if you could talk about that. If you want to talk, me to talk about my childhood in Jamaica, I'll happily um, do that. Um, but I want to start off by expressing deep appreciation um, to the Aspen Institute and to the sponsors, National Geographic and others, for the privilege of being here. And I especially want to thank all of you who made it to this session this afternoon. I think this, um, this, this question of whether or not um, there is nature deficit disorder and whether it is a contributor to many of the health consequences that we see listed in the program has been asked and answered very appropriately but and conclusively by Richard Louvre, um, early on uh, towards the beginning of the century. I mean, there is no question that there is, uh, has been a retrenchment from nature in our communities and that children are spending considerably less time outdoors than they're spending indoors, um, glued to uh, all the uh, electronic um, materials that they have. Um, such as that one. <laughs> such a, exactly, exactly. <laughs> And, and I, you know, I don't think that it is a coincidence, and I particularly like this statement that Richard Louvre uh, made when he, he gave the example of a fifth grader in a San Diego classroom who put it succinctly, I like to play indoors better because that's where all the electrical outlets are. And he concluded, he said, I believe our society is teaching young people to avoid direct experience in nature. That unintended message is delivered through schools, families, even organizations devoted to the outdoors and codified into the legal and regulatory, regulatory statutes of many of our communities, effectively harming much of the kind of play, effectively banning rather, much of the kind of play that we enjoyed as children. So, if we establish that there is this, uh, it's a fact that children are spending more time indoors, very little time outdoors, and we're seeing those health effects that would be attributable to nature deficit disorder. I am really, really happy to say that's a very easy problem to fix because in America, we are here to 630 million acres of land that's in the publicly owned land system, in the national parks, in the national forest, uh, through the BLM, um, through the National Wildlife Refuge, etc. The big question for me is why more of the population is not availing themselves of those opportunities to interact with nature in these very pleasurable ways that we're finding. Right, and I want to get to that in a minute because that will cue uh, Frank and a lot of what uh, uh, you and he are involved in. But I want to also ask Sally about another trend, um, uh, seemingly unrelated, and that's that uh, survey after survey finds that uh, uh, more and more Americans identify themselves with faith. Uh, that uh, much more so than, than say in previous um, in previous decades, uh, back in the days of Henry David Thoreau, uh, that uh, love of God was um, inseparable from love of nature. And I'm wondering, Sally, if in the work that you've done, you've found whether that's true anymore. It's uh, given uh, given 
the dangers uh, to uh, biodiversity given all of our environmental problems? I mean, has there been a disconnect between um, faith and nature? Well, let me say too, thank you for having me here and all of you. I'm, I'm amazed that there are so many folks here that are interested in this subject. And it's an honor to be with the Petermans again. We, just as a side bit, we met in Atlanta. And I was the only, I, it, it was a very emotional moment for me because I was the only white woman to stand on the stage at a Earth Day event that they put on at Spelman College in Atlanta. And it was a huge uh, awakening uh, to me about the wonderful work you've done in bringing the African American and Jamaican American community to understand so much of what we all care about. It's wonderful to be here with you. Um, I might address the answer to this question a little differently than the way you asked it, but I'm going to make an um, assumption that almost everybody who is coming to Aspen to an environmental forum has had a spiritual experience in nature, either growing up as a child or as an adult. And that carries, I think, if you have that experience as a child, right into adulthood. And so many of us, I included, even though I'm an Episcopal church and I'm often inside the walls of a big cathedral, my, experience, my strongest experience of God and presence of God is in nature. And I believe that that is true of most people, but that there has been a disconnect because of the urbanization of our society. And that's something that I think all of us want to address and do something about. And we do teach in our Sunday schools to get children outdoors. We are, we came from nature, human nature, nature, nature. It's part of who we are. I'm gonna make another assumption that everyone in this room out on a walk in nature or on the beach has brought something home with you, whether it's a shell or a rock or a, a, a stick or a beautifully formed piece of wood. We collect those things and we bring them home because it's part of who we are. We are part of nature. And, of course, if you've attended um, a memorial service or if you go, uh, if you happen to be a practicing Christian and you attend a Lenten service on Ash Wednesday. It's from dust we came and from dust we, to dust we will return. <clears throat> this is something that I think as we have become more urbanized, we've lost a sense of. And it's up to all of us to try to reinstate, um, regenerate, if you will, that sense of belonging to God <coughs> through nature. And if what you just quoted as a statistic that more people are becoming interested in faith, I think that the religious community plays an enormous role in reconnecting people to nature through their their connection to God in nature. Well, nonetheless, you, you actually got a lot of publicity for being out there and, and uh, talking about climate change and saying that, that, uh, uh, that, um, that people have a moral obligation um, uh, to... Uh, uh, to reflect on um, uh, uh, you know issues such as climate change and and when you did that I mean it was it, it was um, it was singular it was unique there weren't there, there aren't a lot out there like you doing that and uh, and I wonder if um, uh, when you began speaking uh, uh, in, in churches whether there was some resistance or whether you know it, it became naturally understood to people that there was a connection well that's a great question because it was um, it was in some ways um, very discouraging, in other ways quite hilarious, because when I first started talking about climate change from the pulpit, I was called a communist. I was called uh, somebody who was bringing um, environmental or secular issues, uh, state issues into the church. And this and was in San Francisco, This right? was in San Francisco. <laughs> And um, But that was 10 years ago. Yeah. Things have changed drastically um, in the last 10 years. People have faith of all denominations. Nearly all denominations have a statement now on climate change and the moral responsibility that we have, particularly to look after and serve the poor people, not only in the United States, but all around the world. And um, as Richard Sizek, I notice, is here, and he brought this message to the um, evangelical community by saying that 
Jesus said, what you do to the least of us, you do to me. And if we are called to serve the poor and recognize that climate change hurts the poor people first and foremost and the hardest, we have, as people of faith, an enormous... It's more than an obligate. Well, it's a, it's a serious responsibility to address this issue. If you call yourself a person of faith, you have a responsibility to serve the poor. And if you love your neighbor as yourself, which is in a lot of our traditions, you don't pollute your neighbor's air or water or you, you don't pollute your neighbor's anything. It's, uh, Frank, uh, uh, you're in Audrey's book. Uh, at the beginning of it mentions a phrase that, that uh, to me is very apt and very striking, and it's that uh, um, nature for many Americans is hidden in plain view. And uh, that was, to some degree, the case for you as well. And, and, uh, uh, and uh, ultimately, you sort of began a pilgrimage to, to discover the wilderness, and then after that, uh, to help other people do that. But I wonder if you could talk about that some. Yes, uh, thank you. And again, let me uh, say and we're very happy to be here and uh, very grateful to the Aspen Institute. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to go back to something you asked my wife first. Uh, about their childhood. My childhood was with nature. I was um, the uh, first grandchild on my mother's side of the family. So when I was born in Abbeville, Alabama, my grandmother would not let my mother carry me to Florida with her. So she said there were Indians and alligators there. And so as the first grandchild, <laughs> I had to stay in Alabama with her. And as a consequence, my grandfather was a what would be called the village uh, uh, doctor, I suppose, there in the little community. He did all of the roots. He was a uh, half Cherokee Indian, and so he, um, Crete, I'm sorry, Crete Indian, uh, and he knew all of the roots and what have you. And so as a toddler, I followed him down in the woods and into the sloughs and the branches and what have you in Alabama. So I had a connection to the outdoors most of my life in um, uh, and yet, I did not know about the national parks and the federal lands that are owned here. It was not part of my lifestyle growing up. I was in the woods with my uncles, my brothers, and I hunted, fished, I swam with a manatee, and I played baseball with some of the old Indians. Uh, I had a wonderful outdoor life. But I knew nothing about national parks right there on living on the edge of the Everglades. Um, uh, in fact, my father was a foreman in the Orange Groves, and many of the groves in South Florida backed right up to the boundaries of the Everglades. And yet, I never went in there knowing it was the Everglades. I had been near or probably even into the boundaries hunting and fishing and never knew it was the Everglades. So uh, we have a real... Uh, challenge to make certain that all Americans uh, understand and appreciate the lands that, uh, that we are uh, heirs to. Uh, one last example of this hidden in plain sight is in Miami, Florida. Liberty City, the predominantly the black community there, um, which is about 40 miles from the entrance to Everglades National Park. When we began carrying people there, they were astounded that they lived there in Liberty City and never knew it, was, it existed. And I'm talking about people 60 and 70 years old. I'm not talking about young people. So uh, we have a job in order to protect these places, uh, getting the message out to many, many groups that do not know about these parks. And you may say, why? Uh, it is, you know about these places if you grow up in a house where you have Audubon Magazine, National Geographic, Sierra Club. It is a part of your lifestyle. We, we are talking basically about a lifestyle chain, with, uh, about lifestyle, the reason people don't know. Uh, my parents would have gladly exposed me to the national parks. I had an excellent childhood. I had great parents, but they didn't know. My father had a sixth grade education, smartest man I ever knew, uh, and my mother, uh, uh, was a teacher uh, of elementary school, and they literally did not know about the national parks. Well, and in fact, it's interesting you say that because it's, uh, uh, I was going to mention that uh, 
uh, though a lot of studies have focused on um, children and nature deficit disorder. There was a study that just came out a month ago by uh, the Children in Nature Network, and it was a study really about uh, adults, adult Americans, and their um, their views uh, towards uh, um, their own children's interaction with nature. And what it found was that uh, while unsurprisingly most Americans, when asked, would say, sure, uh, conceptually they like the idea of, of uh, of um, exposing their children to nature, that um, that uh, that frankly a, a, a significant uh, portion of Americans were afraid to put their children at risk uh, out, out in parks. They they uh, were afraid of nature, and so there is a level of ignorance in uh, uh, in, in adults that that's quite clear, and that that study indicated. In fact, further, the study said that that. Uh, uh, something like one in five Americans believed that nature existed further than a 30-minute drive from where they lived. Um, so nature, as at least as they perceived it, um, was somewhere out there, but but uh, nowhere in plain view. Again, Frank, well, you you know you you talked about the uh, the the folks in Liberty City and uh, them being so close to the Everglades. You all brought um, some uh, some of them to the Everglades, and you you were talking to me about that yesterday. And it's and uh, and. There, there was quite a disconnect, right? I mean, that's a, tell me, tell me what their experiences were like when they laid eyes on this place that was so close to them. One of the great things about it, one of the great joys that we get out of the work that we do, is to see the light go off in a person's eyes when they see it and recognize, wow, this is this is. And and the the great thing about it, the connect is instantaneous. Yes. Five minutes in, and people get it. You know, uh, as someone said, I think it was in the New York Times, and as you mentioned, we are hardwired to make that connection. The, the, the unnatural thing is not to be connected. We are hardwired to be connected to nature. That is because that is what we are. That is what we come from. But the uh, people in Liberty City were just, so, they were overjoyed. Uh, some moved to tears. Um, especially some of the older people saying, wow, I've been here all my life and never knew about this. Some were freaked uh, out, right? <laughs> and some were, initially, some, my wife was, uh, she was the one that was comforting those who were a little afraid in the beginning. Yeah. And, and she really did a tremendous job of putting them at ease. And five minutes later, that was gone. And the kids who were afraid, if that lasted maybe two minutes, then they're all, now the thing is to try to catch them, you know, then they're all, <laughs> they're all over the place. Uh, so, you know, uh, as I said, that connection is, is, is instant. And one of the great benefits of that experience um, was in, uh, that after we started those trips, soon thereafter, they made an attempt to make, create an international airport at Homestead Air Force Base. And Homestead Air Force Base sort of sit between uh, two national parks there in South Florida. And that would have been disastrous disastrous if they had put that there. And I'll let my wife tell you about that. Oh, goody. <laughs> if you don't mind. No, have at it. So, so when this issue came up, when the, um, the U.S. Air Force uh, came up with this proposal to transform a relatively small Air Force base into a gigantic international airport between two national parks, they came down to take public comment. And some of these people from Liberty City who had never before spoken at a public hearing or spoken before a government official and would not relish that thought, they manned up. They were like, oh no, we're going to talk to those people. And they were not at all dismayed by the brass and the ribbons and the stuff. They, they stood up and said, no, we will not have an international airport in this place that we have just discovered. There has to be some place in nature where people can go and just have respite from all the things we have to deal with. We've just found this place and we're not giving it up. And, you know, and to, to follow on to that, I just want to tell people a little bit about how we got into this world. You should. Because, as, as you mentioned, I'm from Jamaica. I grew up so wild and free. I had, I had no limits, no boundaries, really. Still. I mean, thank you. <laughs> That's why I'm married to this man. Yeah. I mean, so, you know, adventure for us as children was making a plan to go to the mango bush on Saturday mornings where all of the village children would gather before daylight, you know, and make this trek into the acres and acres of mango bushes with all the most delectable, big, juicy mangoes just <laughs> hanging there ready for the picking. And you're getting into the mango fields just as the sunlight, the shafts are coming through the leaves and oh, heaven, really. And so you pick the biggest, most beautiful mango off of the tree and you put it in your face while it's still ripe 
oh my God. And then, you know, I did my homework by the side of a river watching the fish. So we were so closely connected to nature that the word nature was never actually spoken. The word environment was never spoken. And um, that love and that connection stayed with me when I moved to um, New York. And I thought, well, okay, so now I have to grow up and not see so much nature because I'm in New York City or in a suburb now. But I always found a way to have a picnic my family teased me that, you know, before the last snowflake was off the ground, I would be in Bear Mountain at a picnic, and I got other people to come with me for this experience. So jump to 1995 when I've moved to Florida and met and married the most wonderful man in the world. Our last child is just graduating college, and we decided it's time for us to make our move. We're going to go on hiatus and decide what we're going to do with the rest of our lives. So um, Frank had been watching this movie on TV that was talking about this the Belizeans, and how much they valued their land and their culture, and they thought it was the most important thing that they had to pass on to their children. So we decided, oh, we're going to move to Belize and open a bed and breakfast, go to bed at night with the sound of the howl of monkeys ringing in our ears. I mean, how much closer to nature can you be than that? So we went down to scout it out, and a couple of days, a day before Frank came back home, he was in a Belizean bar having a drink with a local gentleman. They got to talking about cowboy movies, many of which were filmed in the Badlands. And the gentleman said to Frank, so what do the Badlands look like? And Frank said, I don't know. I've never seen it. The guy said, but you live in America. What, all right, what does a Grand Canyon look like? I don't know, never saw it. So when Frank came home, he was like, honey, it's not time, we can't go to Belize, we can't leave this country because we don't know our own country. How about we take a couple of months off and just drive around and discover the country? Yes, sign me up is what I said. But imagine the consternation of our parents and friends who actually brought out guns and offered Frank and said you must intend to take a gun for protection. And they were not just thinking about the animal life, the predator life out there, they were thinking that Human we would be likely to, as black people, off the beaten path we would be likely to meet up with, um, shall we say, uh, a lack of acceptance then from people who might not consider that We've we We've seen belong. the movie Deliverance. Yeah. Right, exactly. <laughs> who might not consider that we um, belonged in the woods. But you know, we consider ourselves, we're citizens of the world, it's our country. So we didn't feel like we needed to protect ourselves or to arm ourselves to go out and experience the country. My God. Talk about a transformative experience. And that's why I believe that the vast expanse of nature that we have in this country is the antidote to nature deficit disorder. And it's so easy. So we drive up the East Coast to Acadia National Park. Everybody has been, right? Wow! On top of Cadillac Mountain. Amazing. I never saw much nature. With, I didn't even know so much beauty existed. I really, literally felt like I was looking into the face of God. I had a transformative experience that said, you know, if whatever the entity is that created this also created you. And then I began to find myself so exponentially beautiful. I had a love for everything and everybody, myself first. And then, of course, we continued all around the country, and I could tell you all about that. But the most important thing was that, apart from all the beauty and the wildlife and the diversity that we were seeing, the one place we didn't see any diversity at all was in the racial composition of the visitors and employees. There was no black people, no brown people. We were like, what happened? Here? In the National Park Service today, 2009, what is the, uh, the labor force is 73% white, I believe? Like that, mm. yeah. trending to 80s, what I, closer to 80s, what I understand lately. Yes. But I don't want to go there because, you know, we can, we can really um, easily overcome that. As I said, when we started out on our adventure, people were like confused, like, why are you going to do that? What is the point? And, you know, you're putting yourself so much at risk. Then when we came back and our spirit was so surfeited with beauty and love and passion, and we started wanting to tell everybody about these places. And then we'd start see people's eyes starting to glaze over <laughs> as we they saw, here come these Peterman's, they're gonna tell us all about all these places that we don't know anything about. So we decided to start a public information campaign and yep. that's how we ended up here. Right, now the, 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 we should stipulate that the fact that the connection to the outdoors has been lost in America is not just an American phenomenon. I mean, I, uh, three weeks ago I was in Crete, uh, which was uh, 
an island legendary in its own right, but made additionally legendary by this so-called Seven Nations study uh, that was produced by a Minnesota uh, nutritionist who found that among these seven nations and even within the, the nation of Greece, that Cretans enjoy the highest life expectancy, uh, despite the fact that they you know, had gallons of olive oil and, and or perhaps because of this, uh, as well as moderate amounts of red wine and, and uh, lots of legumes. And uh, when I visited Crete, you can't go more than a minute and a half without running into somebody in the tourist industry who will cite that study and exult, extol the virtues of the Cretan way. Um, what I came to notice was that many of the people who were um, who were sort of bragging about the Cretan way were obese. Uh, they had, uh, they themselves had failed to take into account a central component of the Seven Nations study, which found that 50 years ago the average Cretan uh, walked 12 kilometers every day through mountains and gorges. Um, it's, uh, so I think it's, it's the case with Cretans as well as Americans that they don't get out much anymore. And I'm wondering if, you know, to some degree this is a, uh, a product of globalization and if one unintended consequence of this um, is uh, that uh, the people have lost connection to what's indigenous. What do you think, Sally? Well, it's interesting. I, I'm thinking, just listening to this wonderful presentation about how you all got started, and thinking too that we have, we don't live on farms anymore. I mean, we've all kind of moved into the cities, and that spiritual experience of growing something, picking it, cooking it, and eating it, which is a spiritual experience, is something few of us do anymore. And when I was in um, in uh, Brazil when the uh, first UN uh, conference happened down there at Rio, and I went up to visit the uh, favela, and I noticed that in, even in that just one of the poorest neighborhoods in the world were cans that looked like coffee cans with dirt and something growing out of it sitting on these fragile windowsills that were in some of the houses are made of of uh, tin and cardboard but people were trying to grow something there and I think it's it, I'm, I'm back to what I said in the beginning it's part of who we are and that that loss has it is a deficit disorder it is destroying our souls and I believe that children who get out into nature build self-confidence that if you get lost in the woods but you find your way home, your self-confidence is built, that creativity is enhanced when you're alone with nature. The fact that we can't see the stars anymore, we can certainly see them here in Aspen, but you can't walk outside in New York City and look up and see the stars. I mean, that's what and who we are. So what, all that's happening for me right now is the tremendous amount of work that we have to do to keep people in nature, keep them attached to the land, and I think that food consumption has a lot to do with it as well, that this um, so many children who think that the fruit that they eat at home grows right off the shelf in the grocery store rather than the tree from where it came, and so it, you know, what we're presenting for ourselves right now is an enormous problem. How how do we get these children? And I do think it happens at a young age. I mean, you're saying, too, that there are all these adults who don't know about the national parks. But I think if you are um, sort of hooked into nature as a child, it stays with you all your life. And I have a big concern about who, who are going to be the next uh, environmentalists. You know, when, when this generation is gone, if our children haven't had these experiences that we've had of being in nature, we're, you know, we may face a world where nobody cares about the environment or there's only a very few people who do. So we have a tremendous, not only to save the planet now, do something about climate, do something about food distribution, do something about water, but also bring along another generation of people who can care about the environment. I was oh. uh, I, I was in Madagascar in um, uh, on assignment for National Geographic uh, for a month in 2009, and uh, they were uh, trying for the first time in in schools in Madagascar to educate the children there about. Um, uh, about uh, about lemurs because uh, lemurs, of course, are beloved uh, uh, throughout the uh, industrialized world. Hordes of tourists come to Madagascar to the national parks to see the 99 endemic species of lemurs. Except the problem is about 40% uh, of those uh, are uh, critically endangered or vulnerable uh, because um, uh, 
a big problem is that uh, they're losing their native habitat, but also that um, the Malagasy people don't view uh, lemurs as being special. They don't view them as being native. They view them as actually being, if anything, for the Mazungas, for the uh, for the foreigners who come in and and uh, and see them. And so uh, they're trying to teach in schools for the first time that these uh, remarkable species that are vanishing before our eyes um, have a kind of value. That that uh, they're they're what defines Madagascar, uh, whether some Malagasy people are aware of it or not. Um, but uh, I I uh, I wanted you know on the subject of of wilderness. Um, uh, there, you know, there's there's the, the the kind of discomforting question of of uh, who is the wilderness for? We all naturally say it's 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 for all of us, but um, but um, I wonder if sometimes uh, uh, people always mean that when they say it. And and Frank, you you and Audrey told me yesterday about uh, uh, a very disquieting example in, in in one of the Gullah Islands about a bird sanctuary that had been previously inhabited by uh, uh, by you know the, the date of Gola and, and I wonder if you can talk about that because I think it's the you know a, a stark example of a, a useful one of uh, of how, how there's a disconnect here yes uh, during I think it was during World War II um, there was a need if, uh, it's called Harris Neck Harris Neck uh, South <coughs> Harris Neck South Carolina and I don't remember all the particulars but at any rate the people who had lived there uh, for decades, uh, centuries, probably, um, were moved off of the land. And once whatever the government purpose uh, was realized, it was not returned to them. It was then turned into a um, wildlife refuge. Um, and legally, they had never really been uh, compensated for the land. Um, and so they're saying, we don't want compensation. Uh, we simply want to return to the land because we lived in harmony with the birds and the animals when we were there. It was, it was not a, you don't have to make it a refuge in order to protect the animals because we did a good job of protecting animals while we were there. And so it is, uh, I think, is headed for litigation. But that's just one of, uh, of uh, many stories like that, uh, you know, we have to be very careful how, how we talk about special places that, and how we designate them. For instance, I was working with the um, Cherokee Eastern Band of the Cherokee Indians, who have uh, a large plot of land, I think about 55 acres, back right up against the Great Smokies, and part of my job was to work with them to get them to um, uh, manage their wilderness uh, uh, along certain management concept. And so they were very cordial and very nice. We, we were sitting and talking. So finally, one of them looked at me and said, you know, uh, in our language, we do not have a word for wilderness in our language. We live in our wilderness. So, you, you know, uh, this whole idea of setting land aside is a good one, but we have to be careful how we deal with that in terms of what other ethnic groups' experiences may be and how they live. The fact that someone's living on it don't mean that they're going to destroy it. Uh, certainly, they care as much for that land. Perhaps, if they're living there, they're far more likely to protect it than, than they are to destroy it. But we have to be very careful when we talk about conservation and preservation of special places because we all don't view it the same way. One last example. Uh, I work for the Wilderness Society. I love my organization. Um, and I've said this to, in the presence of the governing council, you know, to give you an example of how there are ethnic differences that need to be accounted for when you're talking about public lands, for instance codified into law, into the Wilderness Act, is this idea of solitude. That, that, that's, that's great. But I never, I, I, my experience in the wood has always been a joyous occasion with someone, with my father, with my uncle. And if I saw someone having a private moment, then I'll move away from them and let them enjoy that. But that is codifying one group's value <laughs> against and I, can, I think I can say with some assurance 
that most Hispanic and Latino community, the people go in in a very joyous way also. It's, 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 a, it's a family gathering in the woods. It's not one person walking on a path by themselves. It, it's a, you know. So we have to be very careful when we, when we begin to talk about how we use and enjoy land and codify certain values into law versus the values of other groups. Well, I think you know the the main thing where the where the rubber hits the road. I mentioned that June 2010 study, the one that just came out, uh, uh, relating to um, uh, how American adults view their children's interaction with nature, and it found that that uh, in particular um, those less educated, those less wealthy, and yes, you know, the minority groups were were more inclined. Uh, are more disinclined, I should say, um, to uh, to um, expose their children to nature. There's an information gap here, clearly. That's it, and and this is Audrey and Frank. This is what you two have worked with, and Sally. It's what you've worked with in a different way. But I'm I'm curious as to whether there's an applicability in a way of what you have done. You know, reaching out to the faith network uh, in, in a way to uh, in in the same way that information could be gotten to uh, underprivileged communities to minority communities. But but we should probably start. Start with, with Audrey and Frank. You you talking to us some about you know when you um, you, you mentioned that uh, that uh, a, a lot of folks with whom you deal uh, aren't even aware of these parks. Why is that? Why 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 is the information not getting to them? And how can it be gotten to them? Well, uh, his, historically. Uh, just based upon the racial history of America. There were times, very recent times in this country, where black people were not welcome in public spaces. You know, that's just a fact of life. And um, a lot of people have told us, and a lot of research has shown that people have a certain antipathy towards the woods because it was not so long ago that they were forcibly working the land. I mean, it was a hard life. and so. There, uh, there's a level of sophistication associated with getting away from that. And there's also a level of fear that there's not enough security, there's not enough people who look like me yeah. out in the great outdoors. Now I'll tell you, um, we have found that by targeting information to these communities in the media that they use, like the black press, like getting interviews on television stations with and radio stations that have you know majority black listenership, you know, it's, it's, it's the basis of any uh, simple marketing campaign or, or information campaign. You determine what media the people are using, what arenas they get their information from, and how they're most likely to be persuaded, and then you do that. And of course, the message has to come from someone who is trusted. So when we're talking about the issue of the great outdoors and the environment, just by the very fact of who we are, that we look like these people, that we have experience that is translatable to them, makes it very much more likely that they will be willing to contemplate or consider the activity. I'll tell you why that's important. Because in America, now environment and the great outdoors has somehow become codified as a white thing. That's a, a thing that white people do. It's, 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 a, it's a commonly held notion in many areas of the black and Latino community. However, in the last 15 years that we have been engaged with this, I would say we've had considerable success in helping to establish a network of partners around the country who are dealing with these issues at the grassroots level. So now, the, we could point you to 100 black and or Latino and Asian organizations working at the grassroots level to provide environmental education, to provide outdoor exposure. And these people are so gungo about it, we're putting our whole life energy and all of our resources into it. The big disconnect that happens is that then we're not really able to connect to the major environmental groups who we go to meetings that are shall we say, predominantly, if not almost exclusively white, and people bemoan the fact of we can't reach those people, people have actually said to my face, those people don't care about the environment. They have too many other survival issues to worry about. And I'm like, you know, that's an insult because I'm a human being on planet Earth at a very pivotal time in its history when, given the conversation that we've been having in this forum, we need all hands on deck. So to have virtually half of the population disengaged to me makes no sense and I indict the kind of leadership that can go around with blindfolds not seeing that. By 2040, we're projected to be 50-50. So, you know, I'm just here to say we have a lot of opportunity to correct this uh, and to expand the constituency of people who care about and work for uh, and support the environment. And a big part of this is media. I'll give you a good example. And I'm talking about the general media. And we own a Jeep Liberty. Love it. 
But if you see a Jeep commercial, then you think about this. On television, it will show you a Jeep commercial running during a program, and it will show you a white couple or family out in the woods. That same commercial will show you a black couple getting ready to go to the opera, <laughs> pulling up in an urban setting. That has an imprint. That, that, that means that's not just by accident. Now, I understand what the market, the people who are doing the marketing, what they're doing. They are, they have segmented and decided, well, you know, the black people who buy the Jeep, they live in the urban areas, and we want it to be viewed as a sophisticated, you know, vehicle. And it's not just intuitive. They're, they've probably focus grouped this. You yeah, know, they, they, yeah. This is, this and, is a but, conclusion. But, I'm, but that has an impact. Sure. That has an impact. It, it further cements the idea that the outdoors is for whites and the urban areas for black. All right. Sure. Yeah. Well, I'm wondering, I mean, there's, you, when, Sally, as you've listened to them talk about this, and you've and what you have done is go straight into, you know, the faith-based community, incurred some hostility, as you say, initially in doing so, and do you see some applicability between, um, you know, how you have um, sort of, uh, you know, how, how, how you've um, gotten into the faith-based network, sort of, you know, congregation by congregation, and, uh, and, um, making other groups uh, more uh, connected to, to nature, making them more aware of, of uh, the issues that are on the table? Well, I know that you know this, um, but in the faith community of all these different denominations, there is no racial divide. I mean, our, our churches and our synagogues and our mosques have people of all color. So the task here is to educate clergy on the responsibility that we have to be the stewards of creation and have them pass those messages on to the people in the pews. And we're trying to do some of that. I mean, we do have nature study. We have worshiping God in nature for, as a Sunday school program. And we're finding that these things are actually bringing people back to church. Um, there are lots of lapsed mainstream religious people who have actually come back and said, if you talk about issues that relate to my life today, I, I would come back to church. And we're finding that the environment is bringing people back. And, it, and it's an interesting phenomenon, but we, we do have a tremendous opportunity if, if what you're saying with more people getting involved in faith, and then we have these 20,000 20, mega churches around this country where people attend every single Sunday. And imagine the influence that clergy will have if they talk about the responsibility of taking care of God's creation. And I always say that you cannot call yourself a person of faith or profess a love for God and then watch God's creation be destroyed. And But I do believe until you've had that experience of God in nature, you don't know what people are talking about. It's something that, that we have to, to really get young people uh, and old people, everybody, into that connection with God in nature. We just had, a, if I may, wonderful experience with Reverend Durley. Uh, my wife facilitated his having a, getting a, tri a trip out and living at El Tovar in um, the Grand Canyon. And uh, when he came back, he said, uh, I, I know what it is to have a relationship with God. Now that I've been to the Grand Canyon, I know what it is to be in the presence of God. Mm -hmm. uh, he is the pastor of one of the largest churches there in Atlanta, and he has really, really become a strong supporter of environmental issues, conservation issues, uh, uh, climate change, uh, but uh, it, it is transformative. He and I just visited the Gulf together, and um, we've become quite good friends. And I, he is a um, black Baptist minister from Atlanta who is six nine. <laughs> I mean, he is very tall, <laughs> and I am not very tall. And we are a hysterical tag team <laughs> and uh, but he is he and he didn't he bring the black churches of Atlanta together to do some 40 sermons on Earth Day about the earth um, and that was as a result of just watching the movie he said that, that Laura Turner invited him yes they were yeah, yeah um, for details here when the inconvenient truth came out and we showed 
uh, that film in 4,000 congregations around the country, and we have a program in Georgia, but they said we can't show anything that has to do with Al Gore in Atlanta because people won't come. But there was another film that was made by some Canadians called The Great Warming, and Laura Seidel had Richard uh, Gerald Durley invited to be in that audience, and they showed the film in a Baptist church in Atlanta. And when it was over, he stood up. Were you, were you all there? But apparently he stood up and he said, why is this all about white people? These are, this, this, what's going to happen is about my people. And interestingly, the producers of this film went back and made another 10 minutes with Gerald Durley and black yes. children in Atlanta, and they added it onto the film. But he has become a really um, wonderful advocate for climate change and, and, uh, and part of our team. So we're thrilled to know him. <laughs> and it was so easy. And I, I, I want to emphasize, he said that when Laura Turner invited him to see this movie, he thought environmentalist, white people with too much time and money on their hands. But because he respects her, he went to see the movie. That speaks to the issue of trust and respect if you're going to you know, move this past a certain monochromatic demographic. And subsequently, he declared he's become a missionary for the environment. And the number of people that he can touch in a single day, well, is perhaps as many as each of you influential people here could touch. So the point that, I, that we want to make is this whole disconnect from nature, this whole thing of the uh, uh, nature deficit disorder can be so easily remedied. There's another theory of biophilia which speaks to the fact that because we grew up, human beings evolved in nature, we have a biological need for that. You know, I, I think we too often um, fall prey to the assumptions of how difficult things are going to be. So many people have emphasized to me the difficulty. It will be off the charts. If I listened to how difficult things were going to be, I wouldn't do anything. And we, d everything that we have accomplished has been accomplished purely on the strength of the, f first of all, the inspiration that we got in those large expanses of nature and the confidence that it gave us that there's something bigger than us working out here, okay? And so we were moved to this, and so we just push forward full speed ahead. And of course, nobody does anything by themselves. But if you have a big enough conviction and if you're able to inspire other people to the cause, especially when the cause also is connected to something as fundamental as clean air, clean water, life on the planet, you know, duh. Yeah. <laughs> I just want to add one uh, to piggyback on that about how healing it can be to be in nature. That if you're soul searching or feeling empty or unloved, how you can be restored by a walk in nature. And then to share something with you that I'm doing, um, I just heard this, and I and it's okay because she told me it was all right for me to bring it up. But Paula Pepke Zercher, who I had lunch with today, I haven't seen in 20 years. <laughs> Um, came over and she can't, couldn't stay for this, but she said, what are you going to be talking about? And I said, I'm going to be talking about environmental deficit disorder. And she scratched her head for a minute and she said, you know, Sally, I have an autistic grandchild and she's in a special school in New York City. But when she comes out here to Aspen, the symptoms of her autism are much, uh, they're not gone, but they are suppressed and she becomes far more communicative she runs around in the in the trees and the woods around here and they take her horseback riding and and a, and a different child she's eight years old and a different child appears they and I said well why don't you keep her living here um, but she's in her family lives in New York and she's in this special school but that's an example of what we're all talking about this 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 DNA of nature that's part of us and we become deprived and, and sometimes um, quite handicapped by a lack of connection to nature. I wanted to see if uh, I'd like to turn this over to questions now, if anyone's going. Yes, ma'am. Uh, a couple. Yes. My name is Lyra Luis and I'm a architect in Chicago and I was trained under the organic principles of Francis Wright. So I really believe, believe in uh, sustainability so my question for, for the panel, um, Robert, you mentioned that uh, one of the things that prevent 
parents from bringing their children out into the outdoors is they're afraid that you know their children are put on risk. You mentioned that earlier, and also Sally, you mentioned that um, there's a lack of having um, you know exposure to farms. People are you know being um, exposed to cities all the time. So how would you then define your sense of shelter or protection? Because I think one of the we can't dismiss the fact that. Um, the basic human needs, one of those is shelter, you know, food, clothing, and shelter. So coming from my industry in the architecture industry, I think there should be a marriage between the built environment and the unbuilt environment. And, you know, um, coming from the organic principles, you know, what if my industry blurs the lines between indoors and outdoors. Can you repeat the question into the microphone? Because we are recording this. And for anybody else who has some questions, if you like, please. Let's see. It's, uh, it's going to be difficult to synopsize that. And one of you g give me the 30-second version of that, and I'll, I'll announce it into the microphone. Because you had a lot of interesting observations, but they were leading up as well to... Uh, uh, so please, again. Well, essentially, it boils down to... How would you define your sense of shelter and protection? Because that's the one that's preventing you from going outdoors. Sure, sure. So how, how one defines shelter or protection? Do you want to take a crack at that, Audrey? That's I know that there's something called a new urbanism that's going on. And I know that people are really trying to return to a, a design style that brings back the front porch where people can actually communicate with each other, develop a sense of trust and safety, which would also lead to pe children playing in the front yard and or backyard again. I don't know all the specifics, but I certainly am looking to you as the architect to come up with ways to blur those lines. Maybe not so much blurring the line as um, it just made me, th when you mentioned that, it made me think about um, something happened to me as a child. I uh, was in grade school in an old, I, what would you call it, a uh, Spanish Mediterranean type school that had windows that went from the floor all the way to the top of the ceiling. And so you could always see, uh, you got wrapped on the knuckles about, you know, but you could always see what was going on outside. And I, I remember um, there was a banyan tree, a huge banyan tree that was part of our play area. And I, when I didn't want to hear what the teacher was saying, I just went out in the band, I just set my mind out in the tree. And um, they cut the, started cutting the tree down just about the time we learned about the oxygen exchange between plants and animals. And it affected me so deeply that they cut the tree down because all of a sudden I said, I'm not going to be able to breathe because they, they've cut my tree down. So I only said that maybe the design of the buildings that give more access to the outside, it creates another problem for the teacher. But it's also many things that a child can learn while they are there by observing, you know, uh, nature. If, if that address your question. Yes, sir. Go ahead. I have the distinct pleasure of overseeing the management of the two and a half million acres of national forests that surround this valley. Woohoo! Yeah, it's the best job on the planet. Um, but our visitor information, statistics, and demographics show exactly what you're talking about is reaching the, the inability for us to reach underserved communities, urban communities, and recognizing that we don't connect with them just by the way we look. We're having a hell of a time hiring, <laughs> hiring people. So what do I do here in this valley um, that that, or what, what advice can you give me and any other public land managers that have so much to offer? And, and I know the ski industry suffers with this too. Their, their, their statistics on who's coming skiing is this very similar to who's visiting the forest. I would say that, especially in this economy, presenting the opportunity, presenting an invitation, and also having something in place that can give people a sense that they're wanted and belong here, even though they're going to stand out just by virtue of the fact that there's, I am presuming, relatively little racial diversity in this area. People, you have to have not just a plan to recruit people, but also a plan to retain them. And, you know, again, 
as I said, I can point you to a hundred grassroots uh, organizations and you know consulting companies of color whose entire focus is making this change happen. I, I think um, one is not unfortunate. I don't know what the demographic demographic mix is here, but unfortunately, it's not one size fits all, which is always presents a problem for the government because you always and and. And I understand why. I can, sure. you, you need to try to find uh, uh, approaches that reach the most people. But first of all, I think you have to find out what ethnic groups you're talking about to make that invitation to. Because as we found in working in uh, South Florida with the, with the uh, Everglades Restoration Project, that even the Hispanic and Latino community is still divided into sub-communities. And you, know, you can't speak to all of those communities the same way. I think the first job is to, is to find out who it is you need to talk to. And after finding that out, I, I will assure you that there are some organizations that are PR organizations or other organizations that work within those communities. Uh, short of that, uh, give us a call and we'll find you somewhere. At, we've gone an hour, by the way, without um, talking about schools. And I wonder what, what role, if any, they play in this. I mean, it's uh, uh, um, if if, uh, if um, national parks are trying to do what they can to to reach out to underrepresented communities. Are our schools doing the same? Do you have any sense? Well, the Department of uh, Interior is right now going around the country holding these listening sessions um, about what Americans want the great outdoors to mean to them, do for them, look like. And I went to the first session yeah. um, down in Charleston, South Carolina. Naturally, or unnaturally, if there was like a handful of black people, so to 200 other people, so I'm saying, how is this result going to be any different or any less skewed right. than the situation we have now? But my recommendation to them was that they should be including Department of Ed and Department of Health. I mean, that's as simple well, as the nose on sure. your face. That's sure. where it needs to happen. I think with the schools, the problem is, is the one that many uh, government organizations have been money. Uh, for instance, on the books in the state of Florida is a requirement that you teach environment. And well, it was. They might have taken it off now since we started asking them to do it. Uh -huh. uh, was actually legislation requiring that you teach courses on environment and conservation. Not a school in the state was doing that. And when you challenge them to say, you know, gee, here it is. You are required by law to do this. They would say, you find the money. Wow. We, we don't have the money to yeah. do. We've got a bunch of questions, and I think it's uh, only yes. a limited amount of time, so we'll keep them a little shorter. Yes, sir, go ahead. Uh, thank you. for I, I have really enjoyed this. I'm a lifetime backpacker and uh, spent many, many, many days and weeks in the wilderness areas of this country. I have a terrible concern. And that is that if it is not used. Now, at, at one time, I thought that was great because I was out there by myself or with <laughs> my son. Um, but if we don't, if we don't make use of the wilderness areas in this country, and the national parks are also suffering from lack of budget, but we're going to lose those wilderness areas because eventually there will be a con congressional decision that we don't need them anymore and there'll be condominiums built where I have slept beside creeks and what have you. Do you have any, do you have any hope for that? Oh. Uh, <laughs> you know, you, you're voicing uh, a fear that I have. Um, the inviting or uh, expanding the constituency to protect these places to people of color is not a, is not a feel good issue. It is a practical political issue. If half of the population is going to change, then half of the Congress is going to change. And if you have people in that Congress who do not care for these places, they will go away. Uh, we happen to be in uh, West Texas at Fort Davis, uh, and the. The, um, the superintendent there, uh, Chuck Hunt, I think his name is, 
made a most profound statement as he implored us to keep doing the work you're doing. He said, because if we do not reach the change in demographic, that is going to be the demographic bulldozer that's going to erase all that we've done because they will not care about it. So I, I work with the Congressional Black Caucus, which has a tremendous record of supporting wilderness. But that's this generation. That's this generation of elected uh, congressmen. I don't know what's going to happen on the next generation. All I can say is that I will be continuing the effort to expand that constituency to make certain that these places are protected. Yep. Let me move on this this lady right over here. Hi, I'm Rebecca Weiss, and I'm a naturalist here in Aspen. I work for the Aspen Center for Environmental Studies, otherwise known as ACES. And uh, a couple years ago, I was asked to teach a class called Families in Nature, um, a few sessions of it. And I thought, you know, basically the class boils down to how to be outside with your kids. And I thought, gosh, that seems pretty basic. Why do we need a class on that? Then I started teaching it, and I realized why. I saw the fear. I saw the disconnect and the discomfort outside the comfort zone of the, the, the drywall. Um, my question for any of you is, um, I'm actually teaching one of these classes this coming Saturday. And um, as I participate here, all these thoughts are flowing through my head. And I'm getting so much great inspiration to pass on to my families on Saturday. I only have two hours with these people. And I have a very special place in mind in a nature preserve east of town that I'm going to be taking them to. Any suggestions um, for um, how to reach kids, most especially who um, their attention span and uh, the need for sensational things or fast-paced things has sort of taken, taken root with them? How to get them to slow down and appreciate the subtle things in nature um, where you're not bombarded with you know, exciting images one after the That's other. That's the $64,000 so, question you want to answer. So, so when I go to the park with young people, I am more excited than all of them. I'm running faster and going harder and, s unfortunately, screaming louder, too. So, um, you know, I, 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 I don't try to curb or channel the enthusiasm, especially if they're going out for the first time. Let them be free. That's the thing that they've probably lacked their whole lives, the opportunity to just run free. So let them be free, let them be excited. And, you know, obviously you have to take care of, you know, basic safety things. But I think just the opportunity to be free and to, to experience for the first time unshackled will be a very powerful thing. Uh, what we have found that, that early on is that explosion of excitement and all over the place, and more and more they'll draw their attention to one thing. It may be a bug, it may be a limb, it may be right. a tree, it may be more and more. At the longer they are out there, the more they'll begin to you know, really focus in on one particular thing and begin to ask you questions about it. What I would say the most um, basic thing you should be prepared is make certain that you have a good appreciation for the ecology of where you're going so you can answer questions because the more questions you ask, others will come up and ask questions about the things that they find. So I said just make sure that you're very well prepared. You know, I, you don't have to become an expert on bugs, but, right, right, right. <laughs> but you're well prepared uh, about the normal bugs, birds, animals, little mammals that they'll see. If you become the expert, then what happens, it, it becomes a competition among them to come to you with something they have discovered, right. you know, and that's so sort of cuts Pay attention out. to what they're interested in, basically. Yes. Yeah, Sally, did you want to add to that? Well, I just wanted to add quickly, um, I think silence is an absolutely mm -hmm. extraordinary thing for children and a family. If you could even just spend, if you only have two hours, you can't have them be quiet for 30 minutes, but you can have them be quiet for 10, and then talk to you about what they heard hmm. it, from nature in that silence. Beautiful. For the, for the radio's sake. <laughs> yeah, Sarah Stadina, Executive Director of Wild Coast. And we're working at a statewide level in California and then at the local level as well during the Mexican border to, to specifically uh, increase access for underserved communities to open space. And this really comes at the intersection of civil rights because access to open space is a civil right. 
Number two, it's really about the intersection of environmental justice and public health because kids who have access to open space are actually healthier and less obese. Um, and getting back to the built environment, what we're doing in, in Southern California is, first of all, on a policy level, is making sure that bond monies that mostly Latino voters are supporting, because if we had to depend on white voters in California, we would not have any money for open space conservation or clean air and clean water monies in California, is making sure those bond monies actually go back into the communities that are supporting them. Because what we found out was that the bond monies are being allocated by most Latino voters and going to Northern California among for private ranch conservation. So that's been very specific and very important on a policy level. Number two, making sure that when people pay their car registration fee, we have a, a bond initiative, I mean a ballot initiative on the ballot this, this November, it'll be 18 bucks, you get into every state park for free. So the issue of access to open space is a civil right as well. So I think that's, it's really important. This is the most significant issue in the environmental did, movement. Did you have a question, by the no, way? No, I'm going to make a yeah. statement because it's very important. If we only define the environmental movement about white, upper middle class environmentalists and what we like, we will not have an environmental movement. All of us who are working in urban areas and states like Colorado with new immigrant populations have to involve people of color and especially Latino immigrants in that area. And you know what it takes? It requires saying buenos dias. Good morning. Yeah, thanks. Great. So I also am a local environmental educator in the valley and I was asked to speak and I also belong to the Catholic Church down in Carbondale and I was asked to do a present or a discussion with the um, confirmation class there this spring so it's high school kids and 40 of these kids are I mean there's like six Anglo kids involved in this class and I was asked to talk about God and the environment. And I was like, really? You really want me to do this? <laughs> and I was, I was ex excited about it. And I quickly was learning that I was learning more about my community than they were learning from me. Um, I w and this question is, how do we overcome this situation? I'm going to explain. And I was asking these girls, um, probably 16-year-old girls, I said, so where do you find God? Or where else, where else do you find, have these experience, spiritual experiences? And they were like, well, here at church. And I was like, well, that's great, me too. I was trying to get them to tell me about something outside. And I said, well, where else? Well, my family. I said, that's excellent, and that's what I expected, because that's the Latino culture. And I finally said, I said, have any of you ever hiked up to the top of Mount Sopris out here, this humongous mountain, or sat by a river and been, you know, had a spiritual experience? None of them had, and they live 30 miles down the road. And I'm wondering, I think, I wonder if this connection with the outdoors is, is it's an economic thing. It's a rich man's sport to go for a hike on Saturday um, instead of go work to put food on the table for your kids. And I'm wondering, how do we get past that? How do we get these kids who live in this beautiful place amongst us who get out all the time and play and I think of it as a free, you know, I have to go for a hike, it's a free activity. How do, we, how do we fix that? Well, I don't necessarily see it as an economic challenge so much, and it might be in this particular circumstance. I think the perception of the economic challenge might be more apparent than it's real. Lots of our friends, for example, who have been going to Egypt and Asia and the Caribbean, you know, for vacation, st don't go to a national park because they know about those places. They advertise and market to them. They, you know, they want them to come. They don't see anything from the, you know, public land system inviting them to come. But on the issue of um, uh, creating, I think that what you might want to do is to create that opportunity for the young people. What we have found in our programs is people are very much more likely to come and go out hiking if you have invited them, if they're part of a group, and there's lunch. You know, we always, hey, we always include a lunch. So again, invite an invitation, you know, make the people know that they're gonna be welcome, they're gonna be in a group, so that those safety concerns are laid, even if they're subliminal, and there's gonna be food, and there's gonna be a wonderful, fun opportunity. Create the event. I was gonna say the same thing. Take, them, take your class and go outdoors. Because mm -hmm. I, I, I was curious, what, what are the costs? I, I just, I'm just curious, what, what do you consider the, the cost to be in I, mean, I think just the cost of not being parents have don't have the time to right. take their kids oh, the out of right. because well, they're right. working to okay. put food on the table right. Right. yeah There's but you know if the kids tell them they want to go yeah <laughs> you know uh, 
uh, that I think that if you, as they said, if you invite them, you get them out, or uh, you may even want to find some other adults who may want to sponsor the kids, you know, provide transportation for the kids and provide the food for REI, the kids. REI, if you uh, have them uh, in this area. Yeah, REI, I find some organization that will help sponsor the kids. Uh, Regrettably, we have run out of time. Would you yes. also put me in touch with the Catholic priest at your church? Yeah, yeah. So thank you all very much for, um, for showing up. Thanks for the discussion.